Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Laura Leacher, and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. I'm here at Providence St. Vincent in Southern Auditorium. We'll go ahead and get started with some reminders and then introductions. Be sure to join us next week. We will be hearing the fun and informative talk of Thieves Market with Dr. Alex Schaefer. Um, Grand Rounds is a collaboration between Providence St. Vincent and Providence Portland Medical Center. We are often here live at Providence St. Vincent on Tuesdays and sometimes at Providence Portland on Wednesdays. You can always join us live uh, through Teams and you can earn CME credit for any of those viewing options here in person or live virtual or you can watch a recording of the event. And just a reminder that that recording is the same link as the invite each week. The invite each week also lets you know if we'll be meeting live or not. I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout today's session. So for anybody online, please go ahead and post any comments or questions, and I'll mostly hold those until the end as time permits. And now on to introductions. We are joined today by Dr. Jason Haino. He's a practicing primary care doctor and teaching faculty with our own Providence St. Vincent Internal Medicine Residency. Dr. Haino earned his medical degree from Michigan State University then went on to do his residency in internal medicine here at Providence St. Vincent, where he also served as chief resident. Dr. Haino then worked at Intermountain Health, gaining particular expertise in quality improvement. He is passionate about preventive care and has done specialty training in lipid disorders. He's an outstanding clinician and a fantastic teacher. We're so delighted to have Dr. Haino with us today. Thank you, Laura, for that, that introduction. Um, hello to those uh, joining remotely and to my colleagues and residents over at the uh, So my last grand rounds was in 2017 during my chief resident year. The topic was infection prevention. So I guess prevention might be my thing. And like Laura mentioned, and I also apologize for choosing such dry topics. <laughs> So I returned to outpatient medicine after three years of hospitalist medicine, and I became particularly interested in primary prevention and neurology. So I, I went forward and I got certified as a clinical lipid specialist, which also goes by the cooler name of lipidologist, uh, which is you acquire through a bunch of CME and taking a test. So anyone interested should check out the, uh, the National Lipid Association for more. Um, so onward with personalizing risk assessment and primary prevention of ASCD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I have no financial disclosures, uh, though one time at a National Lipid Association conference, I did go into this really cool pharma booth with 3D glasses. Um, I'm not talking too much about pharmaceuticals today, but uh, my disclosure. So. Instead, I'm going to be focusing on risk evaluation for primary prevention. And here's the calculator from the pooled cohort equation that you all should be familiar with. You probably use all the time, either in this form or through the epic dot phrase uh, that you pull up in your clinical notes. Um, something that you do often. It, it turns out that this calculator isn't great. And you probably know that or at least feel that, and, and so do your patients. It turns out that it miscalculates risk in about half of the patients that we use it for. Um, and more often, it's overestimating that risk. This leaves us and our patients both relatively uncompelled to follow these recommendations. So we calculate it quickly and half heartedly recommend a statin in my chart with some facts about whole grains and olive oil. And, you know, there has to be a better way, you say. And I think that there is. Um, so, you know, the pool cohort equation fails to capture the complexity of ASCVD risk and risk factors that may be greater than those in the calculator. Uh, so today I'll show you how I've learned to personalize risk assessments. This allows us to partner with our patients to personalize treatments for lifelong prevention. Um, so today I'm going to move forward with three cases that I hope highlight my approach. Um, but before I jump to those cases, I do want to set the stage a little bit. So I'm going to take you quickly back to medical school or even under your even to your undergrad biochem class here. And this is cholesterol. It's an organic compound. Uh, it's present in all animal cells, can be synthesized in all animal cells. It's part of the cell membrane. It's a precursor for steroid hormones. Uh, it's used in the sense of synthesis of vitamin D. And in itself, it is neither good nor bad. All cholesterol is just the same. It's just a matter of which particles it's found in and what those particles are doing and how many of them there are. 
here are those particles. Uh, this is the stuff that us lipidologists like to nerd out on. Uh, so on the left, we have our high density lipoproteins, the so-called good cholesterol. And then on the right, we have our ApoB containing lipoproteins, LDLs, IDLs, BLDLs, and chylomicrons, uh, most famously LDL. All of these particles that contain ApoB can be atherogenic, but the biggest culprit are the LDL particles because of their small size um, and because of their quantity. Uh, so, you know, we can calculate ApoB, which does allow us to calculate some risk, and we measure that, and sometimes lipidologists like to measure ApoB, maybe some of you do. Um, but more often, we measure uh, LDL cholesterol indirectly by measuring total cholesterol and subtracting HDL cholesterol. We use that then to calculate our risk. And so lastly, before I move on from this slide, I want to point out this other molecule called with the LPA that you see there, um, lipoprotein little a or LP little a. It's similar to LDL cholesterol, but has this extra little red tail on it. I'll cover this more later. So this is a complicated slide, but it highlights a few points that continue to set the stage for the rest of my talk. First of all, the process is process of atherosclerosis starts uh, to start two things are required one endothelial dysfunction and two atherogenic particles this is an important concept to consider when we're considering things that enhance risk for ASCVD because uh, many of these processes are things that disrupt the endothelial membrane um, I refer to this kind of this combination of endothelial dysfunction and particles when I'm talking to my patients as the fuel and the fire Second, this is a complex process that takes place over many, many years, and it's beginning in, to some degree in all of us from early adulthood. Don't, we can't escape atherosclerosis. And then lastly, I want to remind you that what we are talking about in primary prevention of ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we're talking about prevent, preventing symptoms or events, right, either through significant stenosis or acute plaque rupture. Um, atherosclerosis is ubiquitous among all of us. Um, many of us, and perhaps most of us, will not have clinical manifestations, um, but it is there in all of us. Now I'm going to move forward with some cases. So here's Dawn. Dawn was one of the first patients I met after returning to Portland and back to the practice of primary care. He's a 64-year-old man with a history of HIV on antiretroviral. For events to clinic to meet me and discuss some shoulder pain he's been having. I diagnosed him with impingement syndrome um, and referred him to physical therapy. His blood pressure was relatively okay at that time. We had some extra time, so I took a look back at some of the past data in his chart. He has an A1C of 6.0, some elevated transaminases, fatty liver by ultrasound. His most recent lipid panel, showed a total cholesterol of 152, HDL cholesterol 22, LDL cholesterol 105, triglycerides 189. This was done last year. I calculate his 10-year risk, 14.9%. Take a couple seconds and think about his case. So I talked to Don about this, and he says, yes, we've been talking about this for years and years. Every year we bring up some risk and you know I really just don't want to add a medication if there's really not a good reason. He says you know what I retire in a few months I'm really focusing on my health um, and so I'm going to work on getting healthier. We agree to recheck it check the lipid panel in about three or four months and then circle back on this. So Don comes back he's now retired and 65. He follows up for a wellness visit. We get some labs prior. It shows an A1C 6.0, total cholesterol 160, HDL 22, LDL cholesterol 120. We're starting to learn about lipids, so I get a lipoprotein little a, which is 80 milligrams per deciliter. That's elevated, by the way. He's been working on getting healthy and walking. He tells me walking has been giving him chest pain and literally describes it as if someone has been sitting on his chest. It occurs in the mornings and with walking. It improves if he slows down. It's associated with heaviness in his arms. Pretty, pretty typical, pretty concerning. Uh, I, I review his family history, an important part of ASCVD risk. He has a grandfather who had an MI in his early 60s. He was a non-smoker. So I'm pretty concerned. Oh, and by the way, there's this, I get this EKG here, which uh, if you can 
sneak up and look at leads three and AVF, we see some inferior T wave inversions in those leads, uh, which I believe were new compared to previous. So I'm pretty concerned. Uh, I start him on a statin and aspirin. He's agreeable at that point. And I get him into cardiology four days later. I'm hoping he can get an angiogram. Uh, he does go for a nuke stress test first, which is intermediate risk. It does show inferior wall ischemia. Uh, he has good exercise capacity on that stress test. And then he goes for an angiogram. You can see here significant two vessel coronary disease, the RCA and the left main um, disease. And they refer him onwards for, for uh, bypass for cabbage. Um, he was planning on a trip to Europe and he cancels this and instead it gets admitted to the hospital and undergoes cabbage. He, does, he did very well, no complications, recovered well. Um, and then, you know, months later, he did ultimately get to go to Europe with his husband and had a great time. Uh, follows up with me. His lipids are well controlled. His LDL cholesterol is 47 on high intensity statin and azetamide. He continues to work on lifestyle for his for his insulin resistance. But I can't help but wonder and take a closer look at how a more accurate risk assessment might have made a difference in Don's case. So here we have the 2018 primary prevention guidelines. Don't feel overwhelmed by this. Um, I have it memorized. So. <laughs> but Don's case highlights conditions we consider as risk enhancers, this part of the guidelines here. Okay, let's take a closer look at these. I wish there was a more uh, focused version of this, but there isn't. Um, so ASCVD risk enhancers, a family history of premature ASCVD, that's 55 or, or younger in men, 65 or younger in women, persistently elevated LDL cholesterol greater than 160 over one's lifetime, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, some condi conditions specific to women, preeclampsia, uh, early menopause, inflammatory diseases, especially RA, psoriasis, HIV, and South Asian ancestry, um, elevated triglycerides and elevated HSCRP, that lipoprotein little a I mentioned, APOB, which I mentioned earlier, and abnormal ABIs. We're going to take a walk through some of, some of Don's risk enhancers. Um, so HIV is a risk enhancer. The risk of cardiovascular disease is up to two times higher in people with HIV um, compared to the general population with HIV. Don has had controlled HIV for decades. Um, this is the proposed mechanism is thought to be residual inflammation, causing that endothelial dysfunction I talked about, um, even if the disease is well controlled. Um, some older medications also played a, a role in ASCVD risk, and then there's also an increased prevalence of some traditional ASCVD risk factors. Um, so HIV, patients with HIV should be should be should analyze their risk pretty closely. Um, so here's a recent study called the Reprieve trial from last August, and uh, it demonstrates how lowering lowering LDL can benefit the HIV population, even those with lower calculated risk than we would typically start therapy. So. Again, the Reprieve trial looked at 8,000 HIV positive patients aged 40 to 75 on antiretroviral therapy with a 10 year risk of 0 to 15%. So low risk to intermediate risk. Their primary outcome was major acute cardiac events. Um, and their intervention was patavastatin, 4 milligrams. That's a mod moderate intensity statin versus placebo. It was stopped early at five years for benefit. Uh, and we saw. 4.8 versus 7.3 major adverse cardiac events per 1,000 person years. That's always hard for me to conceptualize. Um, but if we look here at this figure, we can see clear separation um, of the, the tavistatin versus the placebo arm in this trial, and it continues to look like it will separate even farther. Um, the observed risk reduction was larger than expected based on LDL reduction alone, kind of looking at past trials suggesting there's an anti-inflammatory effect of statin therapy in people with HIV. Similar benefit to those with an elevated uh, CRP in the Jupiter trial. So, you know, based on this criteria, Don would have fit, he would have fit criteria for this study years and years, decades earlier. Now I'm going to change to lipoprotein little a, which you have all been waiting for. Uh, he, has ha he has an elevated lipoprotein little a, how many of you have heard of that? How many of you have ordered that? 
a few of you. Yeah, Dr. Chow, I see you back there. Shelly once she asked me about it. So lipoprotein little a or LP little a is an ApoB containing particle similar to LDL, which you can see here. Um, only attached to its ApoB is this apolipoprotein A, uh, which has a series of repeated Kringles or Kringle repeats. Uh, these Kringles have similarities to the uh, protein plasminogen, uh, making it prothrombotic as well as atherogenic. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. About 20% of patients worldwide have an elevated lipoprotein little a. Their levels are mostly genetically determined and don't change much over a lifetime, so you typically only have to check it once. Um, and I check it in most of my patients that I'm engaging in a risk uh, discussion. Um, so those with an elevated LP little a have significant increased risk of ASCVD, as you can see here. Uh, patients with an LP little a also have a twofold increase of aortic stenosis. Um, some recommend echocardiograms in all patients with an elevated LP little a. I mostly focus on a, a careful uh, physical exam and screen patients. So a cutoff of 50 milligrams per deciliter or 125 nanomoles per liter is considered elevated. Uh, Providence lab uses the milligrams per deciliter, so remember 50. Um, but you can see that risk continues to increase the higher the level of the LP little a. So um, the absolute number may have a bearing on your, your risk assessment. And it increases risk substantially. And here's kind of another demonstration of that. This is data from UK Biobank showing here at, in, the, in the front kind of blue bars, the baseline estimated 10 year risk and how different LP little a levels would increase um, increase that risk. So in this example, Don's baseline 10 year risk, I told you was about 15% um, with his LP little a of about 80, or about 75. Uh, that increases his risk to about 25% 10 year risk. Okay. LP little a does not lower with statins. Uh, some other drugs do. Uh, but statins are still the first line therapy in these patients because uh, we want to reduce their overall exposure to atherogenic okay. Another consideration for lipoprotein little a is they may benefit from aspirin. So both the Women's Health Study and the ASPRI trial subgroup showed a benefit of aspirin in patient, patients with elevated LP little a. Remember that LP little a is prothrombotic, so we have good biologic plausibility that that, that makes sense. In this pretrial, patients with elevated LP little a on aspirin also had lower risk of bleeding than those with a normal LP little a. So higher benefits, less risk. Published just a few weeks ago was another subgroup analysis, this time of the MESA study, which showed benefit of aspirin in patients with an L elevated LP little a. Here we see an overall risk in the number of events um, in people with LP little a in shades of red with a difference in those that we treat with aspirin compared with no aspirin. Aspirin did not seem to make a difference in those with normals of LP little a in the blue. Pause quickly for a question. Correct, yep, this is all primary prevention. This, this study, yep. Um, yeah, the MESA study was a, a cohort study that looked at a number of different things. The Jupiter trial, for example, I believe is from the Mesa data bank. Um, so expect to hear a lot more about LP little a over the next years. Uh, we're kind of beginning to understand more about its risk and perhaps how we can treat it. This treatment's under investigation currently, okay? Um, but perhaps for now, consider aspirin and consider that in your risk assessment. So another risk enhancer of Don's metabolic syndrome. This figure is key for understanding insulin resistance and its role in ASCVD. So I walk you through this one. So in, we can see that insulin resistance or a decrease in insulin sensitivity starts early, years and years and years before we detect any hyperglycemia. Okay, we can see that atherogenesis begins early in this process as well. Uh, it starts years before hyperglycemia is detected, years before that a A1C goes up, years before diabetes develops. It's the insulin resistance causing the atherosclerosis, not the hyperglycemia. This is something that we've come to know over the 
last several years. So I keep an extremely high index of suspicion for metabolic syndrome and engage my patients in discussing this risk factor early. Here's a recent study. I added this last night, so we'll see how I walk you through it here. Uh, but it, it's the uh, SELECT trial, which looked at semaglutide, a GLP-1 agonist, and cardiovascular outcomes in patients with obesity without diabetes. We know that these, these medications cause, in, or, uh, cause improved outcomes in patients with diabetes, but what about without diabetes? Well, you probably saw this, this trial last, last year. Um, but yes, there is a there is a risk reduction of ASCVD for secondary prevention in patients with obesity without diabetes. Um, but if we look at this trial, two thirds of these patients had prediabetes, and probably even more than that had some degree of metabolic syndrome. I think it's the insulin resistance that we're treat, we're treating um, that makes us see this improvement. We're we also see that high sensitivity CRP goes down with these GLP-1 that endothelial dysfunction. So I think we're going to learn a lot more about insulin resistance and its role in ASCVD um, over the next several years. And remember, uh, metabolic syndrome and obesity are not the same thing. Yes, it's more likely, but they're not synonymous. And we shouldn't miss metabolic syndrome in those without obesity. Um, so again, keeping a high index of suspicion in all patients, especially those with certain risk factors, um, Southeast Asian ancestry, for example. Um, and here we can see the different uh, fractions of metabolic syndrome in obese, obese and non-obese patients. A quick reminder of the criteria for metabolic syndrome. I'll let you read this here as I drink water. Hopefully you all know this. Um, I did hear this last year that someone referred to HDL as the A1C of triglycerides, uh, which I really thought was an interesting way to think about it. It kind of the low HDL tells you about the chronic, chronic, chronically elevated triglycerides. And speaking about HDL, HDL is complex. Um, at low levels, we do know it is a risk enhancer and an indicator of metabolic syndrome, most likely. Um, but at high levels, it can it can actually be associated with increased risk too. Um, that's because it has all these other apolipoproteins, um, and it depends on which apolipoproteins it carries, uh, and what the L the HDL molecules are doing. So, I wouldn't always reassure your patients that a super high HDL is reassuring. And staying on the topic of cardiometabolic disease, late last year the American Heart Association came out with a new paradigm cardiovascular kidney metabolic syndrome, a, a new disease. And they also launched just last month a new risk calculator, the PREVENT calculator, allowing us to add A1C, urine albumin, microalbumin, and social de determinants of health to calculate the risk of both CAD and heart failure. Um, I've used it a couple times, but it's a potential tool for more accurate risk assessment for our patients. So Don doesn't have psoriasis, but I gave it to him because I was curious about psoriasis. Psoriasis affects about two to 3% of the US population, so a good number of the patients that were seen. Um, a large study showed about a 50% relative risk increase of ASCVD in, in these patients with psoriasis. Other studies have confirmed it's a, a similar risk. This is related to com the combination of inflammation causing endothelial dysfunction, along with the fact that these patients tend to carry additional ASCVD risk factors. Um, and the worse the disease, the worse the risk. Um, a few study, studies have suggested that there is a risk reduction for treatment of psoriasis with biologics. So here you go, your list of ASCVD risk enhancers uh, listed in the guidelines. Um, others we didn't cover, uh, the, an elevated high sensitivity CR, CRP, uh, and, and a biomarker that is elevated in both inflammatory disease and metabolic syndrome. Um, I tend to focus more on those diseases rather than the high sensitivity CRP, though I have ordered it from time to time. Factors specific to women. Family history is so important, don't miss that. TKD. Um, and South Asian ancestry. And uh, here's a, a map of South Asia, just in case you're not a previous geography teacher like Jeff Uecker. <laughs> All right. Not that I could find. <laughs> 
but you travel a lot more than I do, so maybe you know. <laughs> Uh, Japan is not. Yes, but I don't know. We can take it. I don't know who you are, but I believe you. It sounds like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Jane, uh, our next case. So Jane and I met two months ago. She's a 52 year old woman here for a preventative visit and to meet. Um, you know, we can ask Jeff, Jeff about those too, uh, <laughs> to meet her new PCP. She has a history of hyperlipidemia on a torvastatin, 40 milligrams. Here's her last lipid panel from a couple of years ago. So hopefully that lipid panel got you thinking a little bit. Um, it got, it certainly got me thinking a little bit and I, went looking through care everywhere and had to open up some scanned in documents from 2012, but I found this lipid panel, um, which shows her total cholesterol of 323 and an LDL cholesterol of 227. So hopefully this case gets you thinking even more. Oh, other history. So um, she has a history of preeclampsia, so I went through her risk factors. Um, ASCVD on her father's side, who had a, a bypass surgery in his 50s um, and developed diabetes well after that, so likely not the driver of it. So here we are. Uh, she falls into the upper cor right corner of the guidelines, uh, though we could have easily missed this if we, haven't, if we didn't look back. Uh, so this part of the guidelines says no risk assessment, do not pass go, do not uh, or do initiate high intensity statin, but this is not entirely correct. She needs a different assessment. Um, and that is an assessment for familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, so familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic disorder that affects uh, one in 250 people. Um, it increases the risk of CAD at a younger age. Um, and most of the time we're talking about heterozygous FH. Um, that's the one that's relatively common. You probably have a few of these patients in your panel. Homozygous FH, two copies of the gene is rare. There's likely about 3,000 patients in the United States with this disorder. You would definitely know if you had one of these on, on your panel and it's probably being managed by um, a lipid specialist. Okay. Um, so think of FH whenever you see an LDL cholesterol greater than 190. Greater than 190 doesn't mean that they have it, but they're at a uh, higher probability. Or if you see an LDL cholesterol greater than 110 on high intensity statin therapy like this patient here easy to miss. Here's some physical exam sign, signs um, that can be found in FH, um, including corneal arcus, uh, your xanthelasmas, um, these eye lesions um, that can be, and about 50% of people with those will have FH. Um, and then remember extensor uh, tendinous xanthomas. And those findings are important because they are part of the calculator that helps us um, determine whether a patient has FH. Um, so I don't expect you to, to know this, but uh, the Dutch lipid score is commonly used. Um, and we can also do genetic test testing that will capture the most common, common mutations and that pretty much rules in the diagnosis. Um, but these patients with FH have lifelong exposure to elevated LDL particles and increases the risk of ASCVD, often developing disease in their 40s, their 50s, sometimes even earlier. Here we see the total exposure of LDL cholesterol increasing risk of myocardial infarction um, earlier, as early as the age of 20s in, in those with FH or elevated LDL cholesterol, 200 or so for most of their life. Early treatment is important in FH. We aim for an LDL cholesterol at least less than 100, um, which oftentimes requires multiple agents. And we try to ship these patients from uh, the left to the right on this on this graph here to prevent or at least delay heart disease. So what was my plan for Jane? Remember with her high, her historically high LDL cholesterol. Um, so we plan to repeat her lipid panel. I added on a lipoprotein little a, which have never been tested and high levels of LP little a alone could explain her family history. Um, turns out her dad actually had genetic testing back years ago, and she's going to try to get uh, the copies of that. 
I did start her on azetamibe to try to achieve her LDL cholesterol less than 100. Um, and on follow up, we're going to discuss whether she should undergo a coronary artery calcium score for kind of better risk stratification. Uh, though she needs to be treated aggressively regardless. Um, I referred her to a nutritionist and discussed the teaching kitchen. Uh, she does all the cooking for her family. Uh, we talked about cascade screening for her two sons. They should at least have a lipid panel. Um, and then possibly we'll escalate her therapy to a PCSK9 inhibitor in the future. So we can apply this model of lifetime risk learned from FH to all of our patients. So like pack years of cigarette smoking, we can think about cholesterol years and work to reduce exposure. For this reason, we need to know what lipid levels are over a patient's lifetime. The AHA recommends lipid screening at patients at the age of 20 and onward from there, and so do I. I, I check them early in most of my patients. You don't have to check them for another five years or longer if things look okay, but at least an initial screening to get an idea. Um, early testing also screens for metabolic syndrome, which we've talked about, allowing early counseling and intervention on that disease. And if we start lowering levels too late, we can only bend this curve so much. So the CARDIA study from 2020 enrolled 5,000 uh, black and white men and women uh, at the ages of 18 to 30. They had equal number in all of their subgroups of race, gender, and education levels. Um, and they followed them at enrollment for 16, or they followed them for 16 years after the age of 40. So enrolled before the age of 40, followed them after the age of 40, looking to under, understand the effect of cumulative exposure to LDL cholesterol at a young age on subsequent ASCVD, um, so when they were older. So not surprisingly, cumulative exposure was highly predictive of cardiovascular disease later in life. That's illustrated here in the top, top graph. The highest quartiles had the most ASCVD later in life. Um, but the slope of the curve also mattered, and it turned out that those with earlier high LDL cholesterol that improved later in life had higher risk than those that started with low cholesterol that, that worsened as they got older, um, showing that earlier exposure is a risk factor. I think we should be looking for this. Younger patients are not included in that calculator that I showed you at the beginning, and they're being missed. Um, but they are included here in our guidelines and should it be should be assessed uh, with high enough LDL levels, family history and other risk factors. Lipid lowering therapy should be considered. Um, and like I said, I recheck lipid panels depending on uh, depending on what their previous panel showed. So oftentimes I wait more than five years for, for reaching repeating this, this test. So our last patient here, Tim. Tim is a 66 year old man. He wants to discuss longevity. Listening to a lot of podcasts recently. He tries to eat well and stay active. His 10 year ASCVD risk is 11.8. For this lipid panel, I get an LP little a, which comes back at 70 milligrams per deciliter, uh, which, is a, which is a little elevated. He has no family history, no other risk enhancers. He remains unsure if he wants to start lipid lowering therapy. I think it's fine. Tim and I decide together to get a coronary calcium score, which is in line with the guidelines here. Um, and the guidelines here lay out a quick way how to use the results for calcium scores of 0, 1 through 99, and 100 plus. A little bit more detail. So just a reminder that a coronary artery calcium score is an EKG gated low dose CT scan. That tells you the amount of calcium um, in the heart and then tells you a risk. It really doesn't tell you too much about anatomy, degree of stenosis. Uh, it's used for uh, risk assessment. It's not used if a patient's having symptoms. There's a small risk of incidental findings. Um, the radiation exposure is relatively low. They're not typically covered by insurance. I've actually heard that's beginning to change, uh, but out of pocket, they're $150 to $200 typically. And for some patients, seeing is believing. You can bring up these scans and you can show them to them in your office. So when to get a coronary artery calcium score? 
um, to help decision making and asymptomatic adults with, for primary prevention who are at borderline or intermediate risk if a decision remains uncertain. Um, and sometimes we can use those in other patients strong family history, statin, statin hesitant, statin intolerant to determine how hard do we really need to push to, to get them on a statin. Um, do not get a coronary calcium score in those with known ASCVD uh, or those with other clear indications for statin therapy, those at high risk, smokers, diabetics, LDL cholesterol greater than 190 with some exceptions. Um, FH patients, though I did decide to get it in my, in my last patient. Um, and generally those who are low risk, coronary calcium score. Um, coronary artery calcium, uh, we, calcification usually or starts to happen around the age of 40 um, and then and then kind of increases from there. Um, so the score is going to increase with age naturally, so we can also look at percentiles. Um, so coronary artery calcium scoring has great negative predictive value, meaning that a score of zero is great at telling us the patient is unlikely to have a vent. Um, turn, it turns out that Tim's coronary artery calcium score was zero, and he elected to defer statin for now. Or for probably at least the, five, the next five years is what we've decided, um, but we continue to talk about it. Um, this data from the Jupiter trial, patients were uh, so remember in the Jupiter trial, patients were treated with rosuvastatin or placebo. And retrospectively, they looked at coronary calcium scores. Um, and those were the, we, um, yes. So in those with coronary calcium score of zero, the number needed to treat with rosuvastatin to prevent one event was 549. And those with a coronary calcium score greater than 100, the number needed to treat was 24. Okay, you can see here four different groups in which the red lines show those treated with a statin and the blue line showing those not, not treated with a statin um, among, with various scores. And the coronary calcium score of zero, the, the two groups are nearly identical. Okay, we begin to see some separation in the coronary calcium score one to 100, here you can utilize the MESA risk calculator, which allows you to put their score into a calculator to talk about how it changes risk. Um, remember, again, like I said, coronary artery calcium begins around the age of 40. So a relatively low score in a young person can actually be very meaningful. Um, and those with a coronary calcium score greater than 100, the difference between the two groups becomes very clear. Those with a coronary calcium score greater than 400 have a similar risk to those that we are treating for secondary prevention, those who have already had events. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you look at their, their overall risk um, and you look at the, the calculator will take into account what percentile they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have a case, let me know. <laughs> um, this is a great summary uh, that kind of simplifies these these rec recommendations of who to get a coronary calcium scar score on and how uh, the, the results might change our um, recommendations. So those with a uh, so coronary artery calcium score may give us another clue who might benefit from aspirin. So more data from Mesa here. Um, so here we have in our bar graph, we have the number needed to treat graft um, with aspirin to prevent coronary vents at five years, uh, looking at the different on the bottom coronary calcium scores uh, subgroups. Okay, the red line coming across the graph represent, represents the number needed to harm as far as bleeding events. Um, so as a general rule, those with a coronary calcium score greater than 100 would likely benefit from aspirin if they have an average. What about those incidental aortic calcifications that the medical record reminds us every year that we need to be talking about? Uh, this was a cohort study from 2018 that shows those with aortic uh, calcification had events rates that were higher than predicted um, based on the pooled cohort equation. Um, and remember that the pool cohort equation usually overestimates risk. Um, so you can see that here where they looked at death, MI, and stroke. 
the huge limitation in the study is there was no control group, no comparison group, um, but a suggestion perhaps that, that these classifications are, are meaningful. Um, I try to scan through my patient's imaging looking for mention of coronary um, artery calcifications or aortic calcifications. Um, it doesn't make or break my assessment, um, but sometimes I think it can be helpful for patients to understand the process um, and kind of see their disease. Okay, so hopefully this is pretty well understood and this is a complicated graph for a relatively simple point, uh, but our study and study again show that LDL reduction, uh, reduction of LDL cholesterol lowers the risk of ASCVD. The more we lower LDL, the more we lower the relative risk. Absolute risk reduction kind of depends on your baseline risk, uh, how much absolute risk and the number needed to treat we get. So this, this graph is a summary of 25 major statin trials um, on both secondary and primary prevention, uh, where we see the uh, difference on the x-axis of, of LDL reduction in millimoles per liter and the relative risk reduction of vascular events for reduction equal or lower LDL reduction, lower risk reduction, lower LDL, lower risk. Um, but two major points here on this slide. So first we're gonna first look at the image on the left here. Um, so after lipid lowering layer, lipid lowering therapy is started, LDL generally continues to decline for several years. You should see, you likely will see at least five years of LDL um, declining after starting a statin or other lipid lowering medication. Another reason why we want to get ahead before the risk starts to get starts to get too high. Now the risk on the right, the cholesterol um, treatment trialist tells us that every millimole or 37 milligrams per deciliter, we see a 23% relative risk reduction. Um, but it turns out that the longer we treat LDL cholesterol, the lower the relative risk, the lower the proportional risks. Um, so we see data here from many different trials. And then we see way out here, some Mendelian randomization trials that look at genetic mutations and, uh, that, that cause lower LDL over a lifetime. And we see larger risk reduction. So again, decrease cholesterol years to lower lifetime risk. So here we have our guidelines. Our patients have taught us a few things, but before I summarize, um, I can't forget to talk about lifestyle uh, and shouldn't be an afterthought for you either. Uh, this is a huge topic, um, but I hope to kind of illustrate a few points um, that that I think my patients illustrate well here. So here's a, a, a epic message I received from Tim late last year. Oh, my chart. Um, you know, so I told Tim to enjoy his holiday and his food and his activity. Um, and I told him not to overfocus on lab values. Remember, a healthy lifestyle is not necessarily for improving lab values, but it's to improve health and decrease overall risk, especially when it comes to LDL cholesterol. When we look at trials of lifestyle intervention, we typically see about two to 3% LDL reduction, okay? Now, some patients may be able to lower it a lot more, others may not at all, but you shouldn't count on it, okay? Um, but however, again, diet and exercise remain important to reduce risk, even if they don't change that lipid panel. A lesson from Don here. Um, so let's go back to his stress test, which I didn't show you. Um, so below, you'll note that the, he had the ischemia that I talked about on his, on his nuke. Um, but above, you can see that he has good exercise capacity based on his VO2 max. There's been a, a few different studies um, that are similar, and there's a more recent one, but this one has the best visual. This is a 2002 observational study looking at men undergoing treadmill stress testing. First, in exercise stress testing, the ability to exercise was a better predictor of mortality than positive findings of ischemia. Crazy. Um, so exercise capacity better predicts death than a positive stress test. Gosh. Uh, and here we see survival curves for those with and without signs of ischemia. So normal stress test, on the left, um, abnormal stress tests on the right, and how the ability to exercise predicts survival. So a reminder that five to eight METs is uh, brisk, brisk walking, eight METs is tennis, jogging, hard yard work, circuit training. 
Um, this data is correlative, but exercise is a risk factor that can be modifiable. And so understanding how your patients are exercising helps you understand their risk as well. Um, I couldn't help but include this figure, which scares the heck out of me. Uh, it shows the normal decline in VO2 max uh, at different percentiles at different ages. So the fifth, the 50th, and the 95th percentile. Um, so greater ex capacity to exercise not only decreases risk of death, but it improves the chances that your patients get to do what they want to do as they age. Um, so really cool figure. And so my last point here with Jane's case is that lifestyle change should be a two way conversation. Know your patients and their habits before you give out advice and empower them to make changes that are right for them. So Jane likely have has FH. She also makes most of the meals at home for her and her family after working a full time job. She understands the importance of diet, of diet on her lifetime risk. She has new pre diabetes. I didn't tell you that and wants to prevent getting diabetes. She hopes to reprioritize time for exercise um, and to talk to her, her husband about how they can make this happen. Um, she does think it would be helpful to meet with a dietitian in her case. And uh, we even discussed the teaching kitchen as a resource as well. Uh, so here on the left is the model for motivational interviewing, uh, which is complex, but um, we can help our patients choose their own steps forward in their health, um, even in the short amount of time that we have. Um, and then on the right is a food pyramid uh, from Old Ways. I think they call it, it's called Old Ways. Um, it may provide a better, though not perfect, re resource for different cultures. They have Latin American, Asian, African. Again, these are huge continents. Mediterranean diet, vegetarian diet. Um, but I've used them as a tool as ways to talk, talk with my patients. So a healthy lifestyle is the foundation of ASCBD. Uh, prevention. The American Heart Association's Life Essential 8 campaign, I think, is a good, straightforward resource for patients and for you as well. Two recent grand rounds that I think you should watch if you haven't. So, Miles Hassel on Graceful Aging, he talked a lot about insulin resistance. Um, and then Stephanie Griffith uh, and how we can uh, discuss size inclusive lifestyle counseling. In our so, let's review what we learned from our, our, our cases. So, First, we talked about the risk calculator, which I think we do OK here right in the middle. That's what we know um, and we know and our computer reminds us to put all diabetic patients on statins as well. Don's case highlighted some of the ASCBD risk enhancers. Uh, recognizing these things I think is the biggest takeaway from today's talk. Jane's case reminded us about the diagnosis of FH, but also helps us understand lifelong exposure to LDL cholesterol and how other and how atherogenic particles increase lifelong risk. We should be evaluating and discussing lifelong before the age of 40. Tim's case shows us the utility of coronary artery calcium scoring and risk assessment and making and having decisions to treat a good tool for personalized care, I think. And lastly, we touched touched on empowering patients to personalize lifestyle change. Risk. <laughs> Great, many, many thanks, Dr. Hino, especially for focusing on um, some cases that we commonly uh, challenge us. Um, lots of listeners online too. I'll begin um, with a couple of questions in the room. Jason, this was phenomenal, just so well organized and I learned so much. I noticed you um, in the Cardia study mentioned that we enrolled black and white patients and I noticed the social determinants of health have made it into the prevent calculator. As you reviewed this and watched the change around equity, do you think we're missing something in terms of stratifying people by race, ethnicity, or do you think these teaching points really apply kind of no matter what the genetic background of someone is? Yeah, I think I think we I think we have a lot to learn still. The cardio study was so interesting and there's so many different things that it looked at. I wish I like yesterday was like, oh my gosh, there's you know, for example, they looked at racial discrimination and those patients that were exposed to racial discrimination had higher higher blood pressure. Um, so there's there's a lot we can learn. I think looking at social determinants is is it's awesome. We have it in the calculator. Um, you know, the Mesa study, for example, was a multi-ethnic study. So, you know, coronary calcium scoring, 
take into account the race of the patient. So I, I'm optimistic that we're moving forward. Um, I haven't, there's a paper I read last year looking at all at social determinants or even job stressors as risks. So there's way more to the, that we could be considered than I talked about. But I think what we're so far is just, uh, you know, the most obvious things. And how can we use biomarkers um, that, you know, may be unbiased in the way Again, very nice talk. Um, two questions. One would be in terms of those patients who have LP little a. You know, shouldn't we be treating those patients with PSK nines since statins raise LP little a, whereas PSK nines actually lower it? Yeah, well, that hasn't been studied, um, but probably. And then we're talking about twenty percent of the population. Incredibly expensive. Um, we know that niacin also lowers it, but makes outcomes that we see. Anything, yeah. yeah, so I think it needs to be studied is my, is my choice. But would, if I looked at a patient who was high risk and was on the fence about choosing a PCSK9 inhibitor, absolutely I would. Yeah, the second would, would be a point in terms of, you know, we did the studies when I was at the University of Washington looking at this metabolic syndrome itself, and we were the ones in terms of Japanese Americans. I think it's important in terms of the looking at the clustering rather than treating the individual situation, such as, again, if you look in terms of triglycerides, we published that data that triglycerides were a predictor, again, of coronary artery disease in terms of events. But if you look in terms of there's been three separate studies, the field study, the ACCORD studies, and recently the PROMINENT study that shows that treating triglycerides doesn't decrease coronary artery disease. As well as in terms of the low HDL cholesterol, there was a torceptopid study that found it actually increased coronary artery disease when you raise the HDL cholesterol. So I think in terms of that category, in terms of it needs to be kind of, it's poorly defined rather than treating the individual components of the thing. Yeah, and then we do see that new drugs like GLP-1 agonist not only decrease event rates, but they decrease high sensitivity CRP, right? So suggesting that, you know, metabolic syndrome is an inflammatory condition and perhaps it's inflammation driving it. Just a comment about the GLP-1s in terms of coronary artery disease itself. When they looked at in terms of diabetics, again, it doesn't necessarily decrease coronary artery events. It was all driven by a decrease in CVA and strokes. No, that I don't know. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what do you have to say? You've no, not mentioned Repathit at all and about its effects on uh, heart disease and re reducing triglycerides. I was on a ventilator in the UK seven years ago with a very serious 10-day comatose with a um, H flu pneumonia. It's probably tracking on an airplane going to Manchester. And since then, by the end of that ventilation in my hospital discharge, which took five weeks, uh, my triglycerides were 600. They varied between 200 and 700 over the last seven years depending on which day I seem to go to see the doctor. And I've recently had a seventh stent put in. Okay, history, diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. everything fell apart after this hospital admission seven years ago. And I've been recommended to go on Repatha. You add the cost of that, the cost of incentive, life becomes prohibitive. Is it mm -hmm. worth it or not? Tell me about Repatha. So to clarify, are you talking about icosapent ethyl? I don't know. It's called Repatha. Yeah. A piece. Of, okay. Uh, so that's that's a complicated question, and uh, I would have to again personalize and individualize. Um, you know, actually, when you brought up your case, I thought of fish oil, uh, icosapent ethyl, uh, which in patients with elevated triglycerides, diabetes, and previous events has been shown to reduce. Um, events, so that is, uh, it's the study's a little controversial because their placebo wasn't exactly a placebo, though I think it makes sense. Um, so PCSK9s, yes, 
good good evidence that they reduce risk. Um, they reduce residual risk, risk left over after statin therapy, high intensity statin therapy, high intensity statins or ezetimibe are used. Um, but you know, are they are they the best medication for everyone? I don't know. We'd have to look at the secondary prevention guidelines, how far where your LDL level is, um, and I'd also want to look at things like your eight your high sensitivity to CRP and consider, you know, is it an inflammatory process that is driving risk? So complicated question, and I think we have to treat the patients in front of us, especially when we're using these expensive medications that can be prohibitive for an individual and for our population. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Hano. Uh, we'll take a couple questions online and let you uh, divide your time in, in answering them in the last four minutes or so that we have left. Um, this may have been partially addressed in your talk, um, but here's a question. What is your opinion of the new CT quantitative assessments of atherosclerotic plaques? Uh, any comments on that above and beyond the discussion of coronary calcium scores. Yeah, so, you know, we're starting to see um, CT coronary angiograms being used um, in primary prevention. I think maybe that's what this question is is getting at. Um, and gosh, yeah, it'll, I mean, you can do a CT angiogram, it'll show you if you have obstructive disease. Should we be using that in everyone for primary prevention? I don't think so. I think we have a lot of other tools. Um, I think we can take a good history. I think we can talk about all these other risk factors. You know, I mean, we see MRI, whole body MRI being done, and if you're doing that in everyone, I don't think so either. Great, thanks. Kudos uh, here for a fantastic talk. Um, any particular thoughts regarding um, statins um, in young women, uh, potentially with familial hypercholesterolemia and specifically implications of pregnancy, childbearing age, and statin use? Yeah, um, so if that's the case, you should, Talk with a lipidologist, but uh, you know, more and more evidence shows that statins for some women are likely safe to continue during pregnancy, though that's kind of a complicated question to answer and a kind of a risk benefit discussion that needs to happen between. It depends on what the risk is of stopping a statin during that period of time. Great, thanks so much. Um, this may be a complicated question as well, but in the couple minutes that we have. Um, any general thoughts regarding starting, stopping statins um, at advanced age? Yeah. I tried not to talk too much about medications, but you guys just want to ask about them. Uh, <laughs> uh, so maybe next year's talk. Um, <laughs> I have a bunch of bonus slides here. So we can come, we can ask Jeff about this one here. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, this I think this is from the Jack Clinical Pathways, but you know, again, this is it depends on the patient um, and depends on their overall number of chronic illnesses they have, right? It's a that's a very complicated question. I think this is a good framework to think about it, um, patient goals. So I, I don't have a a great answer on that one. I typically, you know, generally continue them if there's more than six month life expectancy and they have high risk, um, but that may not fit everybody. What's that? No one wants a stroke at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it depends on, you know, do they want to keep taking it? That's a big question. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hano, for just a wealth of information. We will continue to come to you with our questions. Mm -hmm.